Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. Today's journey is just a little bit different than what we'd usually do, but we're going down a road, really navigating a road, about the Green Book, the movie, and the way we feel about it, the way we see that whole thing of that time period when the Green Book was necessary. So before I go too far, I want you to meet my guest. And you know, of course, I only talk to best friends. So this is best friend, Daphne Barbie Wooten. He is a well-known attorney in Hawaii. How long have you been here? 30 years? Over. Yeah, OK. All right. He is a graduate of the University of Washington in Seattle, University of Wisconsin-Madison, certified international law, Peace Palace at The Hague, all right, worked as public defender for the state, worked as EEOC trial attorney for city of Honolulu, which means civil rights. Um, yes. Right. Actually, it's for the state of Hawaii, for the state. Guam, and, and Samoa. And all the Saipan. territory. All those territory places. Great. And a former civil rights commissioner. And then this is, and she is the author of Justice for All, Selective Writings of Lloyd A. Barbie. Is Lloyd A. Barbie your father? Yes, he's my yeah. father. Was my father. Well, is my father. Uh, still. Yeah. Yes. And he was a civil rights attorney as well as a state legislator in Wisconsin and sponsored many civil rights bills. And he also had a green book. Great. <laughs> Great. And, um, oh, you were recipient of Civil Rights Attorney of the Year 2016. Congratulations. Yes. Oh, thank you. Congratulations. Well, today we are going to talk about the movie, The Green Book. And what is the Green Book. Look, not the movie, the Green Book. The actual Green Book, which is mentioned only a few times in the movie, was a book for um, African Americans and African and, and people of color who were going to be traveling down south because during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, and even through the before 60s, that, before that. and way before that, um, a lot of people of color, African Americans specifically, could not rent motels, hotels, could not eat at restaurants, could not stop at rest stops. And so the Green Book was a book which wrote where a person would go, for example, in Mississippi, where they could go to get food, where they could go to get lodging. And so it, it basically let them know where, where they would be accepted um, if they needed a rest. Well, I have to tell you my experience. And I didn't know it was called Green Book. I was born in Brazil, Indiana, 1938. And my grandfather was the only doctor in the town of Brazil. And we had five houses on this one block. But of course, you know, in those days, the property didn't cost much. But nonetheless, when the entertainers were coming from the South, they always stayed with them because that was part of everybody knew. I didn't know it was called a Green Book. Mm -hmm. I just knew that they stayed. So I got to meet wonderful entertainers all of those years. And, um, but they did, and I, I sort of wondered as I got older how they knew. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, maybe it's just word of mouth, which was also yes. helpful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was, Growing up with this, with this, that's where it, what happened. And even if you go back to the uh, fraternities and sororities, right. which were created in 1900, that was the whole idea: places to stay as they were moving around the country. Mm -hmm. And then I was taught from the as a very little girl that you go to the bathroom before you leave home because right. there will be no place to go to the bathroom after you leave home. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like watching this, this whole thing play out in the movie, mm -hmm. I thought, God, 
really? <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful if you went to um, look at your grandfather's items and you found a green book with his places listed in there? I, I believe that probably that, that can be done. Yeah, um, but it's, it's, like I said, I just never occurred to me that, that it was written down. Mm -hmm. I, I guess if I thought it through, it, of course it was. Mm -hmm. Of course it was mm -hmm. something that they passed on. Right. Yeah. And I did read that generation after generation that they um, changed, that the book was updated. Yes. That's very important. Yeah. So let's talk about the movie. All right. And what did you think of the movie? I saw the movie um, after it won the Academy Award. What piqued my attention, I wanted to see how many times Green Book would be mentioned in the movie. And I had a hint that it would not be that prominent, which it wasn't in the movie. It was about the relationship between a white uh, chauffeur and an African-American musician, Mr. Curley, Dr. Curley. Dr. Curley. And I saw the Academy Awards and the writers of the Green Book get up in a set award and they were all white. And Contrast that to The Black Klansman, which was based upon an African-American's book right. um, and directed by Spike Lee. Um, but I actually liked the movie. I have to say I enjoyed it. Um, it didn't mention Green Book too much, and, but it showed the awareness of the white chauffeur of uh, the segregated South, um, where, where Dr. Shirley was traveling. The awareness that Dr. Shirley was um, quite a star, um, and he would play to white audiences in the South in plantation homes where they wouldn't even give him a dressing room. Right. Or he couldn't even have food. He couldn't sit with the guests who were um, paying for him to play for them. Um, so it showed, although African Americans knew this or should know it from their history, um, it more was a coming of awareness for the um, Caucasian driver. And I understand it was his son who actually wrote the novel, the Green Book, or not, I don't know if it's a novel or not, but wrote about the Green Book and um, got the Academy yeah. Award. Well, and I do know that after it won the Academy Award, or maybe before, a little bit before, um, that the actual relatives of Dr. Shirley, who had never been contacted by anyone, either for the book or for the movie, were quite upset. Well, I read that also, that they were upset. And I also read that Dr. Shirley did not leave the memoir. So, um, and what the son wrote was based on the letters that his father sent to his mother. I see. And mm -hmm. she had, she kept all of the letters. And the son, that her, his mother knew that his father did not write them, that they were too well spelled the grammar was too good, mm -hmm. and it flowed, and it was lyrical, and so she kept all of the letters, and that is how the story is based on. Oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Well, it didn't mention that Dr. Shirley fired him. It didn't mention all the other chauffeurs that Dr. Shirley had. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I still like the movie. Um, even though I really think they should have reached out to Dr. Shirley's family. And, and some of the movie was unbelievable. For example, in the movie, you, it shows the white chauffeur uh, introducing Dr. Shirley to fried chicken, and I just, that's just not reality. I mean, Dr. Shirley knows what fried chicken is. Well, I think white people do not understand that blacks have class. Uh-huh. And that was one of the things it showed, that this man has class. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand that. Today, if you talk to anybody, and they'll say, what do you mean class? Because they have this image of us mm -hmm. that does not speak to that. And I think that that was part of what was shown, is that this man is different than what they expected him to be. Mm -hmm. He didn't fit into he the stereotype. Yeah. Didn't fit their pictures. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, that, and that was nice to see, um, you know, that he, the chauffeur became aware that, that there's a, a broad variety of, of people living differently from him who are African-American. Um, 
because most of what he learned from watching the movie was from TV, TV right? right. Uh, or, you know, the stereotypes. The stereotypes, so yeah. it dawned on him that, uh, you know, there's, there's a big variety. To, to think that this man, Dr. Shirley, lived in an apartment over Carnegie Hall. Now, that was just way out of his image of what we're supposed to look like. Mm -hmm. In an apartment above Carnegie Hall. Really? Mm -hmm. And I loved his outfit. <laughs> yes. He sat on a throne. Uh, yes. Dr. Shirley was sitting on the throne and had his African robes on when he interviewed him. That part I really enjoyed. But I really um, would caution people who are going to do movies and books about African Americans, reach out to the family first. Don't, don't ignore them. Yeah. He, they have something to say. And they would add and, mm -hmm. and, and bring more pieces to the puzzle. Yeah, they said that in the movie, it's as if he was estranged from the family. And they mm -hmm. said he was not. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, they said that he paid for his nieces to go to college. Mm -hmm. um, and he was at all of their parties. And um, yeah, it, it portrayed the family different than what it really was. And had there simply been a phone call to the family, um, that writers are supposed to do research. Yes. Um, the Academy Award winning writers would have, I think, added more depth and more reality into um, Dr. Shirley's character. And he's living above Carnegie Hall. Right. At that point, during the Harlem Renaissance, they were living really at the uh, Edgecombe Avenue with Dorman, mm -hmm. these beautiful condiment. Uh, uh, buildings, mm -hmm. uh, Amsterdam Avenue, mm -hmm. beautiful buildings, doormen that are dressed just like uh, the rest of New York. And I I would have loved to have seen some of that because, you know, that's an image that, that we don't get to see. That's true. And uh, now that you bring this up, I think it's very telling that he goes from this place, I would say privilege, um, whether you're white or black or yellow or green, um, is privileged. And um, he's a very well-known um, musician. To go from that to the South, where he's not even allowed to use the bathroom, um, where you know he's not allowed to eat with people, um, what, a, what a distinction. And so it shows the South in the, I think it was in the 50s, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Shows what was really going on there. In 1960, how they Shirley went on a number of concert tours in the Deep South. Yeah, it just shows you yeah. how people stereotype and view people, but yet they love to listen to his music. I was amazed when listening to the music. As I told you, I stayed up all night listening to his music, and I knew the music mm -hmm. and didn't know him, and that's sad. Mm -hmm. That is really sad, and the fact that his family said he did not leave a memoir. Mm -hmm. So we don't know, except from somebody else's point of view, mm -hmm. what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, during that period, even the, all of the nightclubs that we think about, we mm -hmm. hear in the movies, that was typical. That the entertainers could entertain, but they could not eat, they couldn't stay. Even Duke Ellington, um, with his big band, mm -hmm. he leased a Pullman car. And when they would get to a certain town, they would take the car off the track and they would put it on a side track. So all of his band stayed on that. But he didn't have to deal with going into restaurants and theaters and deal with the segregation. Right, right. Yeah. So uh, the Cotton Club, for instance, oh, everybody yeah. knows about the Cotton Club and Lena Horne, and they couldn't stay. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it would have been nice, I think, if, if just a tad bit of that, so that the audience, today's audience, could understand that period. Right. I, I agree with you. And um, it's real interesting to see that contrast. and. Um, to see, like you said, the Cotton Club, it was basically musicians and dancers, African Americans, but African Americans could not sit in the club in the 1940s and 50s yes. and 60s. They were not a, 
allowed unless you were a musician or dancer. Ooh. And that whole era of the Harlem Renaissance was full and exciting and full of all kinds mm -hmm. of entertainers and poets and writers, names that we all know. And it would have been just, just a minute of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know they did show a scene of um, him going when he was set out of the right. white um, plantation, um, that he went with some people to an African American joint, yes. if you will, a joint, and started playing the piano for them, and everybody started clapping and was very appreciative. Yes. Well, we need to take a break, and we'll be back in 60 seconds. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. My show is based on my book, also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about creating a superior culture of excellence, leadership, and finding greatness. I interview guests who are successful in business, sports, and life, which is sure to inspire you in finding your greatness. Join me every Monday as we go Beyond the Lines at 11 a.m. Aloha. <sighs> Aloha and mabuhay. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming. Salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Aloha, I'm Marcia, and we're back with my dear friend, Daphne Barbie. And for everybody in Hawaii knows that. <laughs> Not everybody. <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay. Well, uh, Daphne wrote a book about her father. Yes. And Justice for All, is that right? That's correct. Right. I have an issue with that. Not the book. <laughs> the word justice. It's it's just us. Not you, not me. Mm -hmm. Just us. When they wrote the Constitution, they did not include us in the mm -hmm. Constitution when mm -hmm. they wrote that justice for all. Mm -hmm. They didn't include women. They didn't include Native Americans. They didn't include people of color. They e didn't even include white men that were not landowners. So justice for all was just us, not you and me. Okay, but well, let's liberty go back. too. Remember yes. liberty because the original Constitution did not um, abolish slavery. It took no. the 13th Amendment, Amendment to do, do that. that. So, so justice for all means we have to fight. To make constantly. Sure to Con make sure it's a reality. Constantly. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So but, tell us about your father, well, okay, about well, the book. I, I wanted to talk about a little bit something you said triggered it, is you said that um, you know, we need to write our own stories. Because if you don't write your own stories, or um, Dr. Shirley's relatives don't write or preserve it, Dr. Shirley, he doesn't have to write his biography or autobiography, but someone close to him could. And that would be maybe a very different story from what we saw um, winning the Academy Award. But if you don't write the story and preserve history in your family, then somebody else may come along and do it for you, which is what happened in the Green Book. Yeah. And so um, uh, being a lawyer, I realized that, that you have to document oh, yes. things and keep things for history purposes. If you want to write it, you got to do it. So what I did is I kept a lot of my father's writings, and he's very well known in Wisconsin. Not so much here in Hawaii, but in Wisconsin he was. And um, he filed desegregation lawsuits, and the first one, that he, the desegregation of Milwaukee Public Schools, which although it was the North, it was still segregated. You know, oh, yes. African Americans went to one school and whites went to another school, and that's the North. So it was still following the pattern of segregation and separate and unequal. So he filed a lawsuit, he won the lawsuit, um, and then after that, he was also a Wisconsin state legislature. He filed a lot of civil rights bills. He filed a bill for abortion, he filed a bill to legalize marijuana. This was way back in the 60s. Um, and many other things that he did, bill for fair housing, of course, civil rights, um, equal rights for women. Um, so I just kept all of his letters, and I knew 
somebody else may come along and do it. So I decided to do it, do it. before <laughs> so that I could have it copyrighted and it would be the family perspective and it would be the bills that I knew he wanted uh, and pushed very hard for. And it got published and it has been out for about a year and a half. And so I invite anybody who wants a copy, you can either contact me or you can um, order it. In, it's on Amazon, but it's also Wisconsin Historical Press as well. So that's enough about my, my book. <laughs> I also wrote another book about, about African-American lawyers in Hawaii, but it's 10 years old. I think you need to update but it. Update, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, more and more people that show up from other places that are attorneys. Yes. yes. And then also I'll talk about you a little bit because you were one of the first hairdressers that I came to here in Waikiki and um, your husband had a shop and there you were. That's the first time I met you. Yes. A long time ago. Well, that was uh, ancient on history. Lures. On, on Lures Lures Street. Street. Yes, that was ancient history. But um, I told there was it was for sale. There was a place for sale. And I said, you know that with us, the biggest issue is our hair. It's a huge issue. It's very big. And of course, he had no idea what I was talking about. And I said, but if you buy this, then people will have a place to go. Mm -hmm. So for 27 years, we had two salons, one at Edgewater and one at the, what was that one, on Beach Walk. Yes. Oh, OK. okay. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. I know. I met a lot of people through the. I did, too. <laughs> you know, all, of those, all of those years. The, when Waikiki was magic, yeah, all of that's gone. Uh, that's I think Trump Tower is right next to. It. Well, that's where the Edgewater was. Uh, they tore it down, and there he is. Uh, oh. Well, anyways, I wanted to also talk about the other movie that won one Academy Award, which was Black Klansman, but didn't win for writing. And I think Spike Lee won for director, but writing I thought was superb. And I did bring a copy of the book, and it's written by an African American. And talk about writing your own history. He wrote it about his experience of um, infiltrating the Ku Klux Klan. Um, and I thought it was a very uh, good film. And I read the book, and I just absolutely loved it. And I just want to bring this into his perspective, since we're talking about films. Birth of the Nation is considered oh a paramount film by some. Right. Not by African Americans, no. because it glorifies the Ku Klux Klan. Klan. It, and you have people in blackface who eat watermelons, and it, it's very it's, negative it towards is. African it's Americans. Awful, it's an and awful it's film. It's an awful film, but it keeps people keep referring to it as the best film made in America. It's not. It glorifies the Ku Klux Klan. So I thought this film, The Black Klansman, was an antidote to um, Birth of a Nation. And so I hope during Black History Month that the film is shown. And if they're going to show Birth of the Nation, they have to show Black Klansman to find out what the Klan was really about, which was genocide mm -hmm. and killing people who were not white males right. and lynching them. And not enough is talked about that. People don't even know sometimes who the KKK is. Even uh, 45 says, oh, you know, in Charlottesville, when he one of know. them rammed well, and killed a young woman yes. who wasn't African-American, no, but they was. didn't seem to care because no. she was fighting for civil rights for various people. And again, that's the Klan mentality. We have to educate the public. And so um, that's why I brought the book uh, as the contrast to the green, um, green book, which I like the green book too, but I just thought well, this was more deserving. My, as I started telling you, my grandfather, this is Brazil, Indiana, and the only doctor in this country town. And in those days, if you uh, didn't have the money, because, you know, during the 30s, nobody had money. So they would bring him carrots and potatoes and chickens and whatever. Now these are, I'm at this, you know, that many uh, non-whites in the town, everybody else. So he would take whatever you had. And this one young man said, Dr. Oliver, what, what can I bring you? And he said, I want a membership in the Klan. <laughs> so about two weeks later, the kid shows up with the membership. So the days go on, and there is a, quote, parade. Now, my mother tells the story. There's a parade. And Mama wanted to see it. And of course, all, as you know, in little towns, his office was on Main Street. So all of the 
offices are on Main Street. So they all line up in to watch the parade, the Klan, which was originated in Indiana. So the Klan is marching down Main Street, and somebody looked under the sheet and said, oh, there's Dr. Oliver. <laughs> oh, I'm boy. Like, my mother said her mother just fainted dead away. Just, oh, mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. uh, but what it did, then he got to know that it was the mayor, the governor, the uh, chief of police. They were all members of the plan. He infiltrated. So he got to see who was Ooh. under there. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's, okay. that's oh. my clan story. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. God. Well, I remember in Mississippi, because my family, my father originally, his family came from Mississippi, um, near Tupelo, Shannon, Mississippi. And we went to visit our relatives coming from north. And we remember 4th of July sitting on the porch of Tupelo in Tupelo, Mississippi, uh, where Elvis Presley. Right. And the big parade, 4th of July parade, who was in it? The Klan. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I asked my great aunt, well, you know, look, the Klan's in here. Da, 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 da. You know, I was getting indignant. And um, she said, we don't pay them any attention. She says, they're always in these marches. Mm -hmm. We don't pay them any mind, you know. Um, but it's interesting, if you look at the history of you know, the lynching and the Ku Klux Klan, and I think they're morphing into different organizations. I know one branched out to the John Birch Society and uh, white nationalists, and there's all sorts of... And the Trump administration. Yeah, there's, there's all sorts of organizations <laughs> that have you know, learn from the Klan, and so infiltration is good. Mm -hmm. So you find out. So you get to know. And so what do you think about the uh, governor of uh, uh, Carolina, South Carolina? He wore the black face and he oh, was yes. in, in the yearbook. And he, oh, um, I, that's Virginia. Oh, I'm sorry, Virginia. Virginia I yes. started to say Virginia. <laughs> but I believe it's probably South Carolina too. But yeah, they had a picture of him in yes. the yearbook with a Klan, either a Klan outfit, and one black person, face. one was in the Klan and one was the black face. Yes. And it was on his page. Yeah. What do you think of that? Oh, dear. <laughs> I just wonder how many more will show up. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what people put in their yearbook. Uh, I don't like my yearbook at all because I don't like the way I look, but there was nothing foolish that I said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. But listen, sweetheart, we are out of time. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No. It's been a pleasure spending yes, this time with fun. you. You come back and do it again. Well, we will. Yes. yes. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. And thank you so much, and we'll see you next time.